We're back with the NALCS countdown as we welcome another day of North American League action. And it looks like our fans have returned with just as much fervor as they did on day one. They'll be catching the new Team Liquid bot lane who had quite the opening day performance versus TSM. We'll see if they can repeat that performance against Optic Gaming in our first match of the day. Well, luckily, we won't need to wait very long as we open the day with that Optic Gaming versus Team Liquid Game 1. Later on in the day, CLG faced their former shot caller, Afromu, and 100 Thieves with Clutch Gaming versus Echo Fox, closing out the opening weekend. Now, before we break down those matchups, moments ago, we had an opportunity to speak, or rather grab a word with one of the newest coaches to the league, Optic's Zabuti. First of all, I think uh, Team Liquid versus TSM was a good example. I don't think it's that much of an improvement on the lane to switch Double Leaf to Sven and Mithy. I know about both of them because I used to be a caster, so I watched them a lot. And I think lane-wise, we saw that Team Liquid was kind of dominant and they actually went for the tempo game and they won it. So I think they're really pressuring with very good players. And the, the, the thing we have to do is actually try to catch uh, catch up on the on the lane because I think they are just the best right now. Uh, but, you know, with, the, with this sloppy meta, there is always a way to actually find a moment to fight. And if we, if we win a good fight, you can win the game. So we're not afraid of Team Liquid, but I think still they are the best team right now and the most prepared one. So we need to actually um, I mean, be careful. Yeah, we need to be very careful about that. I think what we have that other teams don't have is whatever happens, we always have the good mindset. We just... I think i never seen such grinders. The players just literally working all the day and whenever something's wrong, even if the players get mad, it lasts, it lasts 10 minutes basically and then they just grind back. So there is no way we don't improve. Uh, and this is what we aim for when we build the team with Romain, was actually to have people that are not afraid of working and are not uh, blaming the others. There is no blame game in uptake and everybody's very humble about what they do and everybody's aiming to, for improvement. So eventually, that's why I'm saying I, I'm not I'm not mad about being ranked 10 because eventually I know we're going to be a better team within the season, and this is our be best strength within the game. I think it's just we we fight very well. I want to turn to you two, uh, both of you, not too hot on this roster mm. in terms of your preseason power rankings. But you know, what does that conversation with Zabutin do to maybe address some of the issues you've identified with this roster right from the get-go? Well, I do like how he said, like the one of the things we thought about when putting this team together was temperament, kind of of the players. Mm -hmm. and Jet and I were talking yesterday about like what is this team's strengths because there was not like a clearly identifiable game plan that you have with some of these other teams. But it sounds like that wasn't necessarily the primary focus. It was finding good players who will eventually find what works for them mm. because they have a positive mind and they're willing to work through any difficulties. Yeah, similar to my conversation I had with Romain before the season where they don't care if people rank them 10th because they think they're going to outwork everyone as the season progresses. I mean, to be fair, I mean, he's talking right about this Team Liquid matchup is one that, yes, understandably, they're the underdogs in it. And uh, even calling out that Team Liquid, most prepared, most, probably toughest team mm -hmm. by his words so far in this split saying lane, lane phase, lane phase, lane phase. We got to stack up against these guys as individuals yeah. today. I think it's uh, probably important to note that prepared probably means more practiced because uh, <laughs> we're not exactly sure about that. I mean, on that topic, right, we heard from Double Lift yesterday, more confident than ever that his team could take down Optic, even if he doesn't really know what the heck or who the heck is on that team. How are you going to ensure that you continue winning throughout the split, starting with tomorrow's game versus Optic? Ooh, you know, I actually don't really even know who's on Optic. <laughs> but um, we're pretty focused on this match. I, I have no idea. But I think um, it'll be an easy match. Yeah, you call it a trap game when you're looking forward to an opponent. This would be a letdown game, so to speak, when everything was so focused on TSM yesterday. All right, but, but just, you know, we, we, we touched on it briefly yesterday, this kind of idea of hubris with Double Lift. It can, it can be both his, you know, worst enemy and his best friend in terms of his ego drives him. He's one of the most competitive, you know, and driven players in the scene. Mm -hmm. But we've also heard from many of his past teams that sometimes that attitude can, can be the downfall. Especially when he's such a... Uh, you know, just brash talker in general, you're always wondering, like, where exactly is the line between, like, you are doing this for...
you know, entertainment and you're doing it because this is legitimately your opinion on them. Like, you legitimately don't know who's on Optic. Or was it just like, I can't think of them right now, I'll make a joke about right, it. Right, and another piece of the conversation is, even if, let's say, let's pretend Doublelift has no clue who's on the roster for yeah. Optic Gaming, I like to believe that the coaching staff and the organization <laughs> yes. behind Doublelift uh, has a clue. As exactly. a former coach, there has been many times in interviews where I was like, I know I talked to a player about this. <laughs> and, and, like, I, it's all right, I did the work, they're okay. All righty, well, to get their thoughts on the match, let's go ahead and send it over to Riv and Azale who will be bringing you the game, rather, in not too long. Well, thank you very much, Dash. I am here with Azale, who actually got to talk to Zabutin. Yeah. Pretty, we're both pretty impressed by what he said, and they do feel like they have nothing to lose as they come into this one and might give them a little bit of that oomph they need. Yeah, I mean, I talked to him, and it was very impressive to me, you know, how he's talking about their mindset. They did not feel that they were actually very far from a win yesterday. They thought, mm -hmm. you know, a couple plays here or there. You know, he talked to me about trying to play that tempo game against 100 Thieves and, you know, miss execution here or there, and that can kind of fall apart. But he feels that with a little bit of change, they could have had that win, and Acadian felt the same way. So this is a team that certainly, you know, is not looking down on their game yesterday. Absolutely, and if, if this game kind of does go back and forth, I still feel like if TL takes the lead, Optic will have some pinpoints to say this is where I went wrong because TL is on that level at the start to just kind of go through these games at their own pace. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, TL yesterday against TSM, uh, that is supposed to be, you know, some of the top teams in the yeah. league and they made it look very easy. They came out of the gates extremely hot. And for me, it's kind of about can they keep that up, right? Are they going to maintain this level of dominance? Will they breeze past Optic? Right. Or will Optic be able to put up a fight or perhaps even take a game off them? Because in the early days of these seasons, it's so hard to really tell just where these teams are standing. How do you feel like it's going to match up with kind of Xmithy, Acadian, and even once those guys branch out to with having supports roam around with them in that jungle? I mean, it's going to be interesting. We saw Acadian on the Rengar yesterday. If he wants to go aggressive once more, I think if he can link up with a support, get an early lead, uh, that could be a win condition for him. All right, well, we still have a little bit before we get back to the game, so we're going to head back to the desk for the countdown. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Given that we have a full day of, of games, rather, as a sample size, I think mm -hmm. it's time to make some sweeping generalizations yeah. in our first overreaction segment of the split. So here's how it works. I make a statement, and it's up to you guys to determine whether or not that is a blatant overreaction yeah. to the evidence that we, we have We have enough in front information to work from as well. Yeah, yeah. obviously. First up. Bjergsen was the problem. <laughs> Hard agree, absolutely. You know, he's expected to be the biggest carry. He didn't do anything in the last game. He, the same problem as World. String him up. Yeah, get him out. Get him out, him out. No. right? And listen, there's been a lot of conversation about this one zero zero, one of the lowest damage per minutes of any mid laners. Uh, I don't think Bjergsen is the problem, but he is not the solution, mm. and he is not playing like an MVP that he was last split. So by no means did Bjergsen play well in that game they had against TL, and he was definitely part of the problem in that game. Right, I think the is the part that Jad and I take issue with, where it, it's hard to singularly blame him for that game at all, and the team was just categorically outclassed by team. So an overreaction to identify him as the sole right. proprietor of the problem. Next up, TL is the new best in the West. I actually, uh, you know, am leaning towards agree, as, as ridiculous as it sounds to... Uh, so is it an overreaction? Uh, slightly. Slight, <laughs> slight overreaction. That's a cop-out, It is a cop-out. Yes out. or no? All right, we'll go with yes. Uh, I mean, you can joke about the whole, we took your best bot lane and we destroyed them. That's all great. They'll get a chance at Clutch Gaming later on. That's your former first place uh, mid laner. They'll probably take him down too, but they had the fastest win time overall between the two regions thus far. They looked very cohesive in how they did it as well. This wasn't like, yeah. you know... Oh, one small mistake, snowballed the game super hard. They did a series of plays that was very impressive to me. And the team looked like a team that had been around for a while. We even heard Zabutin say, like, in this sloppy meta, you can find a lot of fights. Team Liquid didn't play a sloppy game. They played a very controlled fast game. The fastest game of any of the 15 we've seen in EU or NA. So uh, I do think it's an overreaction because it's obviously one game. But... If one game was all we had to work off of, it would be totally reasonable to say they would be the best in the West. The only undefeated team in Europe is Vitality. I think Team Liquid is better than that. Okay. Well, I, I, I'm, that was full, a I'm fully on yeah, the... Like, uh, yeah, okay, I like I it. I'm both. fully on the TL train here after the one game yeah. victory. Finally, Clutch Gaming has the best jungle mid duo in the North American LCS. Oh, boy. I would actually probably say this is an overreaction. Um, so, okay. But Why is it no reaction? It's, it's only because it's a one game and they look fantastic picking on a weaker opponent in Golden Guardians. And if they perform this well Ooh. against a stronger opponent like a TSM's mid-jungle synergy, 
a TL, something like that, I would, I would be willing to say that this isn't that big of an overreaction. They looked fantastic. Mechanical plays were completely on point in this skirmish that they had in the mid lane. Very impressive, but just not quite a staunch enough of an opponent. So for you, it's about, it's about the opposition. Not that yeah. they themselves didn't perform well or look good in that game. It's just it becomes less impressive to you based on who Right, I mean, con Contracts was in their face. Lyra survived the early pressure. Yeah. That's all great, but in order to snowball a game effectively, you need to be able to do that against very impressive opponents who put up better defense. Yeah, looking at the two of them, though. Febovin, first team EULCS mid laner in the summer. Lyra, first team NALCS jungler in the spring. They're the only team that actually has a first team player in both those roles in 2017. So because they played against Golden Guardians, it's an overreaction. I'm going to do the exact same yeah. thing again. This is one that I, in two or three weeks, if they perform, I'm going to easily say yes. Cool. And I think people should Well, now I don't get to ask the question because you just gave me the answer. You have them in the conversation as the best jungle mid duo. Whether or not the rest of the team pans out the way it was mm -hmm. doesn't mean they're first place, but those two players are super good. I mean, who... What would be, I guess, the team that you feel they have to perform against? Like, give me an example of caliber of team they have to perform against for you, Mark, to be able to say, okay, that's where I'm ready to call them the best jungle. I would love to see this against, like, CLG, where Huhi plays the map very well, Rainover plays the map very well, and those two guys are going to be moving around. If, if this jungle mid duo can go and attack CLG, hold them in their place, and build a lead against that, that would be very impressive to me. I want to see them shut down Jensen. That's hard. That is that's a, tough, a big, that's that is a big a tough ask. thing to do, but it would very much go a long way in proving that they are the best jungle mid. We're going to take a quick break. When we return, Zyrene will share his thoughts on the bot lane meta. We'll check in on some predictions, and one of these two will tell me how Optic beats Team Liquid. Don't touch that browser. They do.
Welcome back to the NALCS Countdown, where we intro the day's matches before the timer hits zero, and we jump into Champion Select. Yesterday, we witnessed how much the game has changed since preseason, but Zyrene took a magnifying glass to what we're seeing in the bot lane. Take a look. Thank you, Dash. I'm here to talk about the state of the lane, and today we're talking about the state of the bottom lane in particular. At Worlds, we ended up seeing an Ardent Sensor carry meta come out, and then at All-Stars and Kespa Cup, we saw it shift to Poke, where we saw Jin, Misfortune, and Ash take Comet and push people out of lane. Now, we're seeing Sustain rise up as what's countering that poke and pushing it out. So we're seeing things like Fleet Footwork overheal and Relic Shield be taken on AD carries to make sure that they can sustain and negate all of the poke that would have been coming out. But because this is so powerful and all of these were slightly buffed in the last few patches, we're pretty much seeing everybody take this. 78% of the AD carries in NA, EU, LCK, and LMS have taken Fleet Footwork as their keystone. The others are pretty much Callisto with Lethal Tempo and then Ezreal with Kleptomancy. But aside from that, what that means is because you can't really let Poke sit in the laning phase and it's being sustained through, Hyper Carries are going to start coming up. Tristana, Vayne, we're also going to see some Kog'Maw as well because when that poke doesn't stick and the laning phase means less, hyper carries get to that mid late game easier and they're going to have that late game team fight impact. And speaking of that impact, when you have those types of laning phases that don't matter as much, the supports also shift. No poke supports, we're gonna be seeing some Tom Kench. We're gonna be seeing Braum to protect that AD carry, to keep that hyper carry safe. We're gonna see some Shen for playmaking, some Taric on top of that, and also, a lot of Alistar, because these guys have that mid late game potential when the lane phase doesn't mean as much. So the whole bottom lane is kind of shifted. And a player that I think this could really favor is Optics AD Carry Arrow. The former MVP is a guy that really hasn't had the best laning phases in the last split, but he's always been a team fight god. His Twitch, his Kog'Maw are things you always have to consider in champion select and look out for, because he would be able to crush a whole team with them sometimes. But the state of the game never stays the same. Patches come all the time. And in 8.2 on the PBE, there's currently a nerf to Relic Shield that dissuades AD carries from taking it. So, until further notice, that's the state of the lane. Back to you, Dash. Thank you very much, Zyrene. Just one of the many areas in which we're seeing experimentation yeah. with runes reforged on the new patches. I want to continue this conversation about the state of the game outside of bot lane and what interesting rune choices you think pros are utilizing here in the opening week. Yeah, one thing I think is the single most powerful rune in the game would be Super Magical Boots um, because it's 350 gold of value basically with the move speed and you just get them at 10 minutes. And a lot of champions don't want to build them until then anyway. And then on top of that, I think Stopwatch is contributing to some of the slower early games we've been seeing uh, because even though it does enable tower dives, it's much easier to avoid tower dives with it. Affectionately known as free ass boots here on the North American LCS broadcast. Yeah, absolutely dominating the meta. It's not just in bot lane. This is every single person getting these boots. Clutch yeah. Gaming had a last game, you know, yesterday. All five of them took it. Yeah. It feels like the kind of thing we're like, yeah, it's nice to get some extra stats and this and that. But you know what's great? Just free money. Money. <laughs> Inspiration, get it. I'll take money. money in the nutshell. Mm -hmm. Feel free to throw, throw me money. All so, right. What do you want for your birthday? <laughs> I'll take money. some cash. Yeah, yeah just no, you need some shoes. cash. <laughs> Here we go. Predictions for the day. Both of you sitting with three correct oh. and oh. two incorrect from yesterday. Oh. The only difference in predictions coming in game five. So one of you will come out the other end of this weekend as a loser. Just want to point that out. But let's talk about <laughs> this difference in Echo Fox. Clutch gaming, defend yourselves here. This was one where it was like my mind's telling me no, and I was like, I <laughs> should go with uh, your clutch gaming. Yeah. yeah, I went with my. I ended up going with my mind in clutch gaming. I'm a very logical person. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, they were someone who I think is a much better team all around, and the big concern is in the top lane where Solo had a good performance yesterday, which is the only reason I'm sticking with them because he was able to do well in the counter matchup. I know there's a big difference between Lorlo yeah. and, and Huni, uh -huh. but I'm hoping that they can actually stick with this. They'll be able to keep him safe enough. Give him counter pick, just do it to stay stable in the lane. The rest of your team should be better and should outperform Echo Fox. Yeah, and I think this is a conflicting matchup for sure, and that's why we would defer on it. Right. But I have been iffy on whether or not I'm buying the cryptocurrency that is Echo Fox with their crazy roster. Uh, <laughs> even just yesterday, you know, Clutch Gaming, you saw seven kills to two. 15 kills to two, that is technically a more impressive win versus what I think is a more impressive opponent. Right? And then on top of that, I'll look at the mismatch. I think Huni is absolutely on his game. We know that Solo is going to be the largest question mark on that Clutch Gaming roster. And 
then, right, if Hootie, how much will Hootie smash versus how much will Lyra and Febaven beat up on the mid lane of Echo Fox? But Dardock played great yesterday, and I think he can do some protection. So a lot of volatility in this matchup for obvious reasons, but kind of like yesterday when you're asking, like, why would you pick Echo Fox over FlyQuest? I'm like, because Hooney. Right. And yeah. Mark continues to doubt Hooney picking against him That's twice. right. You picked against him yesterday. You were incorrect, but you have more faith in Clutch Gaming being able to, being able to control that variable this time around. Right. Hootie will be the reason I beat Mark in predictions this week. Okay. For the year. Have it later. And the year, yeah. yeah. I'm very excited that it's game five, so we really are going to have the tie break mm -hmm. uh, in that fifth game. One other team I want to talk about heading into the day is Cloud9. Uh, did pick up a win yesterday in the day opener, but had to make it a comeback against CLG, one of the rosters yeah. that you're very hot on. So how do you feel about Cloud9's day one performance and looking ahead uh, against pr a presumably easier opponent in Golden Guardians? Yeah, this might sound a little strange, but they are who we thought they were, mm -hmm. even though I thought they would lose to CLG. They, I think, outdid them in draft with the Zillion, and yes. that was the game decider. Because early on in the game, that top side of the map, which was a huge question mark, was a huge detriment to them. Sven Scaren fell behind in the jungle. Licorice also died twice and lost his turret. And in normal circumstances, unless you have a huge compositional advantage like C9 had in that game, they would have lost. So yes, mid lane, bot lane is still strong. Huge question marks in the top lane, in my opinion. I think both teams kind of came out looking good for game one. CLG executed on a good game plan early on. C9 had a better draft, and then were able to play that draft out once they were able to stabilize. So both teams had high points for me in that game. All right, well, earlier, Sven Scaren shared with us how different the team environment is on his new squad. Moving into the Cloud9 house was pretty easy experience for me because everyone is super like relaxed kind of. So even when we're scrimming, it doesn't feel like stressful at all. Like compared to my old team, it was just a lot of stress and it would get really heated in a lot of arguments and stuff. So in Cloud9, I think everyone is more open like when uh, you do a mistake and it's just a lot easier to like move on and actually like admit your mistake rather than get in, into like 20 minutes arguments after every single game. So yeah, I'm just happy about the super relaxed. I mean, let's talk about team environment and what that can do for players, you know, in the moment mm -hmm. on the stage. Again, if, you, if you're in a high pressure situation where mistakes in an organization or a team are looked at or yelled at, you know, and it was such a critical eye, it's a lot harder to recover in the moment like Sven Skaren had to do, accepting the fact that he he misplayed early. And his team in the draft is what kind of built him back up and got him on an even playing field. I mean, you have to imagine that working with Sneaky and Licorice is going to be easier than Hauntzer and Double if just purely in terms of the personality types in the team. And sometimes, while it's coming from a good place of like, I want to figure out what we did wrong, let's right. talk about it. At some point, it's like if you're getting into 20-minute arguments over it, the amount of value you're getting from that argument is, is horribly based off the timing that you're spending on it. Yeah, and when you see this move, on paper it should work and can work for Sven Skaren if right. he's given more freedom to be who he wants to be on this team. He's been a great jungler in the past, worlds multiple times, carried tons of playoff games over in the ULCS. So he's got it in him as long as he has the environment for it. Uh, to, to me, that's where the interesting discussion lies is because I think if you stack contracts and Sven Skaren's performances up against each other in 2017, it's kind of hard to decide who I really think contracts is better better yeah, and, and arguably way. contracts right so a lot of people looking at this move on paper and they're going what did cloud nine do in the off season mm -hmm. but when you start to look at personality and what team environment can do to mm -hmm. unlocking a player returning sven scaren to that lee sin world's performance form if yeah. he's given permission more ownership over his decisions maybe we do see a meteoric return uh, you know, for this player. Yeah, and for enough of these teams that are talking about long-term, now that we're franchised and we no longer have relegation, like work ethic and history of work ethic is very important, and Svenskeren has those things. All right, but now refocusing back towards that first matchup of the day, Power of Evil shared with us his expectations versus a th uh, thriving Team Liquid. I don't think we have, any we have anything to lose because no one expects us to win against them. At the same time, if we were going to win, it's going to be a huge upset. So... It's just we can do, we can do, we can only win in, the, in this matchup, and we can learn a lot because if we if we get if we lose in like 30, 40 minutes against them and pull up a good show, uh, losing early in the split is not that bad because you can instantly improve and kind of drop in reality if you are really bad, and if that happens later in the split, it's really hard to pick up and to improve again after winning like let's say a few like weeks in a row. 
I mean, Power of Evil says they can only win in this matchup. You can still lose. Uh, not, yeah, I was going to say, we might want to clarify to him that lo losing is still a possibility. But but I, what I'm going to do is return now to uh, another win condition segment here. This time around, though, not going to make it easy for one of you as you have to defend Optic's ability to win this game. And as you chose Team Liquid yesterday for your prediction, Mark, I'm going to flip the tables on you and make you defend Optic. You can say it's because you trust me more to argue on their behalf. Or, yeah, we'll go with that. Yeah. Um, for me, my advice for them, the win condition would be be yourself. You heard Zabutin kind of talking about it, how it's a sloppy meta. You can find wins and things. And in their game yesterday, we saw them picking some slightly different meta things. They had Morgana into Braum. They had Rengar taken relatively early on. And those things work together in a really interesting way where you can put the Black Shield on the Rengar, have him go in. Ren uh, Morgana beats Braum. So they have these kinds of things that they're doing that we haven't really seen that much out of other teams yet and they can hopefully use that to get an advantage in the laning phase and you heard Zabutin also talking about how tempo focused they are how tempo focused Team Liquid is and if they can get ahead early on and keep driving that it might put Team Liquid on the back foot yeah and for as much as Power of Evil says like oh we no matter what we can win that mindset has helped him succeed a lot in the past when mm -hmm. he's come in as an underdog uh, and Optic is clear underdogs in this game based off of preseason expectations and even what we saw yesterday okay uh, but as far as having a letdown game for Team Liquid, they need to treat Optic like they treated TSM. They got up for that match. They were hyped. Everyone wanted to win from Dublin. Everyone was on their best behavior, playing safe, punishing mistakes. If they go into this, and we know it's just a double lift soundbite, but if there's a level of disrespect towards this Optic team of we're way better than these guys and we can disrespect them, like... Doublelift lost to Power of Evil at the World Championship, right? Mm -hmm. Arrow was an MVP in just the spring split of last year. There are players on this team that demand respect. So uh, Team Liquid needs to take them very seriously and pick a late-game team comp in case something goes wrong in the early game. They need Steve, the CEO, to go out there and make another $15,000 bet. So the <laughs> pressure's on their back, and they have to play it like TSM. That's what it, they really need. I don't Every think we can game. handle that. We can't sustain that kind of, that kind of sure? pressure. I don't. Have you seen his investors? <laughs> <laughs> okay, actually, good point. <laughs> Oodles of money, right? Yeah, Oodles. Oodles. Uh, the, the point that Jad was making about uh, go, picking for late game is good, though, because Optic, when they didn't succeed on their tempo play, the game mm -hmm. ended up stalling out forever, and, and it became a, the longest game that we've seen in North America, 65 yeah. minutes or whatever it was. And so pick some scaling, challenge them to be the better tempo team that they, that they need to be to win, mm -hmm. and then if not, you have the better players, you have the better synergy. Yeah. I mean, I do have some questions around that bot lane today because, yes, they chose the Ezreal Morgana into a Braum lane. You know, Arrow finally got a small right. CS advantage, but it was a lot in part because of the matchup today against Double Lift, you know, much arguably a tougher bot lane duo here. You know, there's going to be some questions around how they stack up today, Lemonation and Arrow. Yeah, and this is probably a bit of a gotcha stat, but the worst CS differential in lane yesterday was Double Lift. Oh, really? against Ven and Mithy, even though they were up on gold because they killed them a bunch of <laughs> ganks. So, a little bit strange, and then Arrow had the second best CSD, but they mm -hmm. didn't take the turret, and they didn't actually make advantages off of it. So, that's what really has to happen. The I think the world of we won by seven CS, therefore we won the lane and we are better, is over. It's about how much pressure you're creating and whether you're paying those advantages forward. So, that's where Arrow and Lemonation have to do something. It's a perfect example because, you know, Double if lost lane by 13 CS or whatever it was to Sven and Mithy, but Mithy made the mistake. So yeah, like, yeah, okay, you won lane, but what was the Doesn't net matter. result? All right, well, it's a lopsided matchup in terms of analysis, but anything can happen in a best of one and so early on into the season. That's going to do it for us here at the State Farm Analyst Desk now to toss it out to the casters to get us in the game. Guys, take it away. Thank you very much, Dash. We are back at the casting desk. Beautiful job with the countdown as we are almost into game. We are now on patch 8.1, as we have known for the past few weeks, and we are about to see Optic and TL go head to head. And Power of Evil saying they have nothing to lose here. It's kind of a win-win, but they still have to play strong to kind of feel that confidence. Yeah, I mean, you have to have some confidence. It's still yeah, early in the Relegate yourself to you that already. Just, <laughs> exactly. I mean, they're only down 0-1, right? If you get a win here, it would be really big for them. Perfect. But even as he said, if you can be competitive with Liquid, who according to Zabutin, is the best team in the league yep. right now, that does bode well. Because if you can have a competitive team against the best, then you can certainly start taking games off some of the others. So what are we thinking here in Champion Select? Who's the focus? Where's the focus? What should be first? What should be last? Give, hey, give it all to me, Azale. I think if Optic want to stay true to what they, they were okay. talking about,